Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from the New King James Version, the Apostle Paul writing, and he says this, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now let me just stop and say, when he says this earthly house and this tent, he's talking about his physical body. In other words, uh, we are not a body this is what we look at when we look at other people. We see their bodies. They see our bodies. But you are the person inside. You're the, you're the person on, of the heart. Actually, inside of your body is your soul and your spirit. Your spirit's the part of you that can be born again and be the, become the righteousness of God in Christ, can discern the things of spiritual the spirit realm. And uh, the natural part, the soulish part, really doesn't tap into it. It doesn't have the ability to tune in to spiritual things. It has to learn from your spirit receiving those things and then transmitting them to your mind. And so you discern spiritual truths through your spirit by the Holy Spirit. Of course, you can learn facts and understand uh, reasonable, rational things from the Bible. But spiritual discernment, needs to happen through the spirit and then it enlightens your spirit enlightens your soul so paul is acknowledging that the real person is on the inside and i like to say it this way we're looking out of these windows called eyes but you're the person on the inside so when your body dies and goes into the ground well you don't cease to exist you will exist somewhere and i pray that it's heaven and not hell, because Jesus came so that nobody would ever have to go to hell. So Paul once again says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, or a house, or another body, a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Uh, in other words, we're not just going to turn into a mist, or we're not going to just dissolve that no, we'll still have a form, we'll still have the same uh, appearance that we have now with the head and shoulders and arms and legs and so on. He said, we're still going to have a form of a body. So he's saying, for, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, or we could say with our body, which is from heaven, if indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, talking about in this human body, we groan being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. So he's saying the, the inside person is groaning. Now, why are we groaning? Re really, Paul brings this up so beautifully in Romans chapter 7, when he says, the things that I want to do, I don't do them. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing those things. And then he goes on and toward the end of the chapter, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? See, our physical human body is not saved yet. When we get born again, your spirit gets saved, but your body is carnal. It's fleshly. That's what carnal means. It's fleshly. And so your body just wants to sin. Your body wants to eat whatever it wants to eat, uh, whenever it wants to eat it. Uh, however much it wants to eat it. Your body wants to sleep when it wants to sleep, lay down when it wants to lay down, play around, mess around, you know, joke around instead of focusing sometimes when you need to. Your body is just your body. It, it likes to do things that are comfortable. You have to push your body to exercise and to work out and to keep yourself in shape. And so uh, what Paul is saying here is that the inside person, the person that is born again, Oh, you want to do right before God. You want to walk in obedience and sacrifice to honor God and such. But the body, no, the body doesn't want to do that. So he's saying inside we're groaning, not because 
we don't want to have a body, but we want to have a body that will be complicit, a body that will be compliant, I should say, a body that will be in alignment with what the, the Spirit wants to do, what God wants us to do, instead of just always wanting to be pleased itself. And so he's saying, we don't want to be unclothed, but we want to be further clothed. We want this mortal body to actually be transformed to where it's immortal. It's not subject to temptations and such. It's not so self-centered. And so this is what he's talking about. And of course, Paul's taking this eternal perspective because we're so naturally uh, we're so naturally minded and we're so earthly minded. That's the word I was looking for, earthly minded, instead of being heavenly minded. And the book of Colossians says, set your mind on things above where God is. And this is what Paul's doing. Paul's saying, look, in this earthly life, we're always struggling to obey God because the body and so often the mind as well want to please the flesh. But he's saying, oh, we groan inside. Oh, we want that new body that God has for us, which will come at the end of the age. And we're going to be saved, spirit, soul, and body. And that's the order. Spirit is when you're born again. You're saved. You become the righteousness of God in Christ. Your soul, your mind begins to be renewed. The more of the word of God you put in, the more your mind begins, uh, becomes renewed to the thoughts of God. And eventually it'll be it'll be really renewed at the end of the age but at but your body your body is just your body the way that it is and whatever you can do with it to get it in shape to make it obedient do the best you can but your body will actually not be changed until the end of the age when Jesus comes back and then all the bodies of the believers will be changed into immortal bodies and they won't be tempting you anymore they won't be tempted I should say to sin and so, once again, uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about us wanting to put off our physical body that's tempted and to get the new body. So he goes on to say now uh, in verse 4, For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So the Holy Spirit being inside of us is God's guarantee that we inside are going to live forever. And so therefore, we're going to eventually have to have a body that will live forever, not age and decay like our bodies do. And they'll be able to just keep up with us in the Spirit. So verse 6, So, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. What does that mean? That means as long as I, the spirit and soul, am inside of this body, while well, I'm absent from the Lord in this respect. doesn't mean that the Lord is not in my heart. But what it means is that Jesus physically is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. And so if I'm in my body, well, that means I'm on the earth. But if I die, if my body dies and is buried and I leave my body, notice what he says happens. He says, while I'm at home in the body, I'm absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident. This is so important. Verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This shows us what happens to believers when they die. Their body is really the part that dies but their spirit and soul don't die. So if you're born again, oh, thank God for this. If you're born again when you die, you're present with the Lord. You go directly to heaven to be with the Lord, uh, but your body will go into the ground here. And so it says to be at, we rather, we're well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present here on earth before we die, or absent after we die, to be well-pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what He has done, whether good or bad. So he's saying every one of us as believers, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And of course, that judgment seat is a judgment to see if all of the things that we were doing on this earth, the, the things that keep us so busy, well, uh, God's going to take a match to them, so to speak. He's going to test them by fire. 
it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says he's going to test them by fire. Also in uh, Romans 14, it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And those things that were not eternal, they did not have eternal significance. They were not pleasing to the Lord to affect people's lives or advance the gospel or anything. Well, it's going to be burned out. It doesn't mean all of that was uh, wrong or wicked. It just means that they're not going to be rewarded because they were not eternal things. But all those things, like what we're doing right now, we're spending time in God's Word. Oh, I think these are the kind of things that are going to be rewarded, along with giving to uh, the poor, uh, tithing, sowing into the kingdom of God, helping people that are in need, uh, witnessing to people, the gospel, winning people to the Lord, discipling people, etc., etc. All of those things that are for the kingdom and for God's eternal purposes, all those we're going to get rewards for. And we come before the judgment seat of Christ, that Greek word bama, that B-A-M-A, as we would uh, spell it in English, the bama seat of Christ. And he's going to judge every single one of us. Every one of us will stand. We're not going to stand for our husbands or our wives. We're not going to stand for our bosses or our employees. We're going to stand for ourselves. And he says, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Verse 11, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. So in other words, he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, know that you're not just going to get there, and uh, this is some casual peer seated on the throne. No, in fact, I really try to avoid any of the talk that says, well, I'm going to talk to the big man upstairs, or you know, the, the, that guy above, or whatever. And the casual way that we, re that we refer to the Creator God, the Holy God. I think we should avoid that casualness, uh, except to say Abba, like my Father. But that's very endearing. It's not treating Him or talking to Him like He's a peer, because God is not our peer. He is our God. He's our Father. And so this says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men and are well known to God. So we should be thinking about the judgment seat, not with a worry, but with a reverence, like, hey, this is real. This is really going to happen. I, I need to live my life. We need to live our lives as if we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. So he's saying, I'm not trying to commend and we that are writing this letter to you are not trying to commend ourselves to you to puff ourselves up but he's saying but i'm bringing these things up as to how we live how we minister to you how we sacrifice in our own lives so that I'm, i'll give you an opportunity he said we are giving you corinthians an opportunity you boast you share the kind of lives that we live the kind of sacrifices we make the humility the way we serve God with, with honesty and integrity. He said, we're giving you an opportunity to boast on our behalf so that, he said, that you may have an answer for those who, are boast in, who boast in appearance and not in heart. In other words, Paul is referring to people that come to minister to the Corinthians that say, we're, we're apostles just like Paul's an apostle, but they're putting on you know the nice clothes. They've got the suit and tie, so to speak. They've got the look of a, an apostle, somebody that's esteemed, somebody that's doing well. He said, but they're really boasting more in how articulate or eloquent they are, uh, how they come across, uh, and, and that happens today. And Paul said, you should know the difference between somebody that just has the look and comes across well and somebody that really lives the life that they're supposed to live. He said, so we're giving you opportunity to boast on our behalf because you should know the way that we live because we lived among you. Verse 13, but if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. 
And we died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now, I just have to stop here and comment. He said, the love of Christ, he said, if we're of a sound mind, it's for you. He said, but if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. So he's saying, if I'm talking in a rational way, a logical way, a reasonable way, he said, that's because of, of you. He said, but if I just share what I've been taught by the Lord, the revelations, and you don't understand them, he said, that's for God, because I'm I'm talking of things that he said to me. He said, but the love of God compels us, constrains us. The love of God limits us to be able to communicate to you in a way that you understand and not just at the level of our knowledge and what's been revealed to us. He says, he says because we judge us that if one died for all, then all died. In other words, if Jesus really did die for the sins of the whole world, then it's just like everybody has already died for their sins. This is a profound truth, but it's, but it's real. He said, if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So you know what this tells us? Sin is not keeping anybody out of heaven because Jesus paid for the sins. The only thing that's keeping people out of heaven is them receiving the sacrifice of Jesus for their sins declaring him and serving him as Lord of their lives. So that's the issue, not sin, not sin, even though sin is there, but sin has been paid for if they will accept the payment and begin to exchange their life. So it goes on to say, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Notice, Paul is not trying to say here, hey, if somebody got born again, they never sinned. They're never in the flesh anymore. Old things have passed away. Everything's new. No, he's not trying to say that everybody lives a perfect life after they get born again. No, what he's saying is that if somebody is born again, they're in Christ then we're not going to look at their flesh and their flaws on the outside. We're going to look past that. We're going to look at their spirit on the inside. Because in their spirit, that person that really became new is, uh, is brand new. Old things have passed away. They're a new creation in Christ. He said, we're going to look past the flesh and we're going to look at that spirit. And I've noticed when you begin to talk to people as if they're a righteous spirit, they begin to uh, rise to the occasion of that. But if you talk to them based on their external, their flesh, their weaknesses, then it pushes them down to act out those weaknesses because you're getting them to focus on the outside instead of focusing on who they are in Christ. And so Paul says, we've determined that we're going to focus on who people are in the Lord, that all things have become new. Verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us, notice, we who are born again, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ when he was here on earth. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Notice, he wasn't here to condemn them for trespasses. He was here to pay for their trespasses and to get them to reconcile to God through the blood of Jesus. So he says, uh, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed now to us the word or the message of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We could say it this way, in place of Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. And here's what we implore, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the gospel. We're now ambassadors for Jesus, and here's our message. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So when you get born again, you are, no matter what your body's still struggling with or your mind, you, that born-again part of you is now the righteousness of God in Christ. See yourself that way. Acknowledge that. Declare yourself righteous before God by grace and by His blood. And watch the Lord 
take you from being a new believer or somebody who still struggles in the flesh to having breakthrough, breakthrough from bondages and such. This is exactly what happened to me. And this is the exact passage through which it happened. Begin to declare, if you're born again, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not a sinner anymore, though my flesh has struggled with that. I'm right with God, and therefore I have the strength not to sin anymore in Jesus' name. And watch the change that it will make.